Yeah, so Rust is definitely a friend, I would say, and I also hope to show you that this is the case. Um, so this talk is going to be a bit schizophrenic, so the first half will be about word representations and uh, to give a bit of a feeling of what they are and how you can use them from Python. And then the second half, I want to show a bit how you could actually uh, build Python modules in, in Rust. So um, I'm Daniel, but there's another name listed here. I just wanted to give credit to him since he also did a lot of the implementation work um, together with me. And um, so today I'm going to talk about a project called Final Fusion, and it actually consists of a few sub-projects. So the reason that we started Final Fusion was that we're using word embeddings a lot. So we do NLP, we do parsing, uh, named entity recognition, part of speech tagging, all those things. But we're always sort of juggling with many different kinds of word embeddings. And then also with at least two languages, namely Python and Rust. So we decided to make one format um, that does everything. Of course, some of you may know the XKCD that points out that now there is yet another format, but I'm going to um, blissfully ignore that. Uh, and the goal of uh, Final Fusion is to make embeddings that have a simple format. So the format should be trivial to interpret in different languages. Um, it should also be programming language uh, agnostic. So there are some existing good embedding formats, but they rely, for example, on serialization that is offered in that particular language. And then if you want to use the embeddings from another language, you basically uh, cannot do it. Um, we want to support the features that we need, which are uh, obviously normal word embeddings, but also word embeddings with subword units so that you can assign embeddings to uh, unknown words. Um, and um, quantized embedding matrices. So quantization is a method to compress uh, embedding matrices to make them much smaller. And finally, we want the embedding matrices to be memory mappable so that, uh, so these matrices can become pretty large. Um, so in terms of space, they can take uh, three or four gigabytes of memory. And if you're on a low memory machine, obviously you don't want to load that into memory. So for that reason, we want to support memory mapping so that you can map the embedding matrix into memory in the OS sort of pages uh, uh, it in and out uh, by need. So we have a specification uh, of this. But with this come uh, a few utilities. So the first is um, called Final Frontier, which is a package for training uh, word embeddings. So if you know word to vec or FastX, it's similar to that, except that it combines many different models. So you can, for example, do dependency embeddings with subword units. And there's currently no other package that offers um, most of these combinations. Um, then there is a Rust crate for using these embeddings in Rust. <laughs> and this is actually the reference implementation for Final Fusion, and the Python module builds on um, this crate. So we also have a Python module. And then finally, we have a bunch of command line utilities to use the embeddings. And um, um, in the future, we hope to add more languages, which is at this point not uh, a lot of work. But first, I want to take a step back and talk a bit about what word embeddings actually are, because I don't know if everyone here is familiar with them. So to understand word embeddings, we sort of have to travel back in time and look at how words were represented in NLP, so natural language processing, before word embeddings. And what people did was they encoded words using one hot vectors. So the idea behind one hot vectors is that you create vectors that are the size of your vocabulary. So here uh, we have a toy vocabulary consisting only of four words. So that means then that your vectors uh, have four components. And um, for each word, you set a different component to one. So here, for example, Hawaii sets the first component, Italy sets the second component, et cetera. Um, so this served us well for a couple of decades almost. However, the problem of this representation is that the vectors themselves are orthogonal. So the angle between any two vectors here is exactly 90 degrees, which is kind of bad when you think of it because Hawaii is more similar to Italy than it is similar to, say, Mario. So we would actually expect the vector of Hawaii to be closer or more similar to the vector of Mario. But here, that's not the case. All vectors have the same angle between them. So this is the problem that uh, word embedding start to address. And why this is a problem, I would like to show with a short example um, from named entity recognition. So the idea behind named entity recognition is that we get a sentence, and we have to mark the names. And for each name, we mark uh, or classify what the type of entity is. So, for example, if we have a sentence like Billy lived in Hawaii until his family moved to Alaska, then we want to identify Billy, Hawaii, and Alaska as names. Well, in English, that's kind of simple, right? You just look for all the words that start with a capital letter. But, you know, if you're familiar with German, uh, all nouns start with a capital letter, so it's a bit more difficult. But then the next step is to not just identify these names, but say, well, Billy is a person, Hawaii, and Alaska locations. 
So suppose now that this sentence was part of your training data, and now you've trained your model and um, you want to do a prediction, so apply your named entity recognizer to a new uh, sentence. So suppose now that we get this sentence where some Spanish sculptor uh, named Mario resided in Italy. The problem now is that if these particular words didn't occur in your training data, since all the vectors are orthogonal, it becomes quite hard to identify that Mario is a person and Italy uh, is a location. Of course, uh, a model could still look at the context of these words and say, well, you know, here there is move to, well, you usually move to a location, or lived in, and you usually live in some location as well, right? But we can already see in this second sentence that we have resided in. So if resided in didn't occur in the training data, it becomes quite hard to make these inferences. While if we knew that Italy was similar to Alaska and residing is um, similar to living in some place, um, this task would be much easier. <coughs> so this is the problem that embeddings try to solve. So instead of using one hot vectors, we use dense vectors um, where um, all the components have some value, like um, in this matrix. And usually, um, the number of components is between 50 and 500. So this is a hyperparameter of your training procedure um, that you can pick. And obviously, the larger your factors, uh, the more information they uh, encode. But at some point, you get diminishing uh, returns. So um, if we actually um, plot these vectors that we saw in the previous slide, we can indeed see that uh, Mario is more similar to Billy. Um, and Hawaii is more similar to Italy, and Hawaii and Mario, for example, are very dissimilar. Of course, this is a toy example, so here there's a more realistic example. So these are actually based on 300-dimensional um, word embeddings, which I reduced to two dimensions using TSME. And um, uh, I picked, for example, a word like, um, well, one is gone, the usual problem with themers, um, having different color sets. Well, one of the words I did was Python. I looked up the 10 most similar words, and for example, also for cinnamon. And we see that, um, um, words that relate to cinnamon have similar clusters like cloves or ginger or lemon, but also words similar to Python uh, tend to cluster with uh, other words that have to do with Python like, um, I don't know, I think there was Pythonic here, Python 3, uh, WX Python, etc. So this is obviously what we want because then in such an example, even if we don't see Hawaii, sorry, even if we don't see Italy in the training data, we can infer, well, Italy is somewhat similar to Alaska and Hawaii, so it must be a location. So that is the goal uh, of word embeddings. Um, so due to time, I will skip um, this slide. Um, so I want to say a brief thing about training word embeddings. Um, I, I won't go into the mathematical details now, but the intuition is that, well, we want vectors such that similar words have similar vectors. And um, the the idea behind the training procedure was already um, um, theorized um, in the 50s, uh, for example, by Harris, who said, well, if I take the word eye doctor and the word oculist, they're both going to occur in very similar contexts that have to do something with eyes and healing eyes, etc." Whereas if I take a completely different word like lawyer, well, usually lawyer co-occurs with words like um, law, sue, uh, sue etc. So the, the context in which lawyer occurs uh, are very different than the context uh, in which eye doctor or oculist occurs. And the usual training models use this, so they look at uh, co-occurrences and based on that try to make um, the vector similar. Okay, so more practically, um, the training procedure looks like this. So you start out with uh, some large corpus, typically hundreds of millions or billions of words. Um, and um, first your words are presumably, uh, or your sentences are like this, so uh, punctuation is attached to tokens and sentences are not split. So the first step is then to do tokenization and sentence splitting so that uh, sentences are nicely separated and tokens are nicely separated. Um, and after you've done that, that's basically all. So you don't need annotated data. You could just take any data that you tokenize and then train embeddings based on that. So it's really nice in the sense that it's an unsupervised um, training procedure and it allows you to make better word embeddings by simply getting more data and um, adding that to the training. So once you have collected your data, um, you can, for example, use Final Frontier um, to train based on your big corpus, which is just in um, UTF-8 format. And um, usually, well, you could actually run it without any other parameters, but usually these are the parameters that you want to set. So you want to specify the dimensionality of your word embeddings. So larger is better in terms of you get better vectors, but of course they take up more space and memory. 
Uh, the number of epochs is the number of times you want to go over the training data. So here, it will go over the whole corpus 10 times in order to train the vectors. Um, the minimum count specifies um, um, which words should be discarded based on frequency. So all words which occur fewer than 10 times will not be used um, and will also not be trained in embeddings for. And the reason to do this is that um, usually when a word occurs very few times, like, I don't know, two times, it's very hard to get a good vector uh, embedding for that word. So for that reason, we just discard um, infrequent words. And then finally, you can specify the number of threads to use um, to, tr to train um, the model. Um, well, this can take a while depending on your hardware. So usually we train on one billion worth corpuses with 20 cores and then it takes about between 12 hours and a day. Um, if, if you don't have that kind of hardware, you can download pre-trained embeddings where the work has already been done for you and you can just use the embeddings directly. Okay, so that, um, it, these are the basics behind embeddings and how you get them. So now I wanted to show uh, how you can use Final Fusion embeddings in Python. And um, the API is pretty simple. Um, so first of all, you can install the um, um, module as a wheel from PyPy. And um, so you just do pip install Final Fusion. At the moment, due to how the utility works that builds um, the module, we cannot specify dependencies yet, so you have to explicitly say, well, I need NumPy as well. And then once you've um, installed the, the wheel, you can um, obviously use it, but there's typically one class that you want to use. The rest um, is not that relevant or is used by this particular class, which is uh, embedding. So from Final Fusion, we import embeddings, and then everything we're going to do after this, we do using this uh, class. Okay, so first we want to load uh, a particular set of embeddings that were pre-trained. Um, so we do this by uh, using the constructor of embeddings, and it takes a file name, and it will load the full embedding matrix into memory. Um, so as I said, this can be fairly large. So if you don't want to use that much memory, you can also um, choose to memory map it. So then we add a keyword argument saying we want to memory map. And this will only load the vocabulary um, into memory, but not the embedding matrix itself. So uh, it will leave the actual paging to the OS, and the OS can choose if there is enough memory available to, in the end, load the whole embedding matrix in memory as we're using it, but it can also decide to remove pages from memory. So I would say this is typically what you want, um, unless you are very often using the complete um, embedding matrix. Okay, so the first scenario, how you want to use word embeddings, and I think this is the most common one, um, is that you want to use it in a machine learning model. So, for example, if you're doing named entity recognition, um, you're not going to insert words as one hot vectors anymore, but instead you want to uh, put their embeddings as the input to your, say, neural network. And um, in order to do that, we need to retrieve an embedding for a word from the embedding matrix. So this is done using the embedding method. So we give it as the argument some word, and um, then it returns the embedding. Uh, I'm slicing here because otherwise the embedding wouldn't fit on the, on the slide. Uh, and as you see, it returns it as a NumPy array. So you can directly feed these, for example, to TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, another interesting thing is if you try to look up a word um, that doesn't exist, like Gunningen, um, it works as well. So at least if you train the embeddings with uh, Final Frontier, because Final Frontier also learns um, embeddings for subword units. So the way this is processed is that Gröningen is chopped into uh, pieces, n-grams, from um, by default three to six letters. And um, the training procedure also learns embeddings for these n-grams. So once we have a word like this, it will chop it up, it will look up the embeddings for the pieces, and then sum and average them, and then it returns a vector for that as well. Of course, the, the question is what the quality of this vector is going to be, so hopefully in a later slide I can convince you that it's at least some meaningful vector. Okay, so I, I would say that this is actually the most frequent application of word embeddings, whereas this is what they usually show you if they show you word embeddings, which is either similarity or uh, analogy queries. Um, so similarity queries answer the question for a given word, which are the n words that are the most similar to this words in the uh, vector space defined by the embedding? And um, this is computed usually uh, using cosine similarity. So cosine similarity of one means these vectors are identical. A cosine similarity of zero means they are orthogonal. And a cosine similarity of minus one means that they're opposite. Okay, so let's try to do this and find the 
most similar words for a cinnamon. And well, there's a keyword argument limit to say how many uh, embeddings you want to return. Um, if you don't specify this, you get 10, um, 10 the 10 most similar words. And it will return a collection. Um, it's actually a binary heap um, um, for which, which we can iterate over and then we can get the actual word and the similarity. So we see indeed that similar to cinnamon are words that have to do something to cinnamon, namely that they're mostly, uh, I guess in this case, all ingredients as well, like nutmeg or ginger. Um, and these are then the cosine similarities. So um, this is actually fairly um, high. Okay, so that kind of works, but um, I guess uh, you might be curious, well, in the case of Groningen, um, what do we get out there since we don't know if the vector that is produced um, using the subword processing actually is a meaningful vector. And um, so if we do the query, we actually do get full names of towns. And um, well, since this uses the surface forms, um, the names of towns are actually uh, ending all with Ingen. But that's fair, right? And it's good enough because in a typical task where we want to know that Groningen is a location, um, these are indeed locations as well. So it probably provides us enough information. And of course, this speaks to me since I work for the University of Tübingen. These are mostly German town names that end with uh, Ingen as well. Um, I, I also did this query on a Dutch model. So this was trained on English data and you get out this, but if you actually use word embeddings that are trained on uh, Dutch data, you do get things like Zwolle or Amsterdam or Rotterdam, et cetera. So uh, it's also to the, due to the nature of the language that we get out these German um, names. Okay, another type of query that you actually don't do that often, but people do always in demonstrations, so that's why I'm doing them here too, uh, and they're kind of nice, are analogy queries where you find words um, D uh, in analogies of the form A is to B as C is to D. So for example, uh, we could query Ajax is to Amsterdam, what Feyenoord is to um, whatever. And uh, when we do that query, so I'm only interested in the best result, um, because I think Feyenoord fans would be upset if this returned Amsterdam as well. So I would just show uh, the first uh, result, which is indeed Rotterdam. And similarly, if we ask, okay, uh, Amsterdam is to Ajax, what Rotterdam is to, it will return Feyenoord. So you can do queries like um, that as well. And that type of query tells us a bit about how consistent the underlying vector space is in terms of linear uh, relations. Okay, so the next thing, um, on the agenda is to, to get rustic. Um, so it turns out that the module that I just showed is completely written in Rust. So there's no Python in it. And well, usually when a module is not written in Python, it's going to be written in Cython or C or C++, but this module is completely uh, written in Rust. And that's nowadays actually quite easy to do. So your first question might be, well, why would I actually use Rust? Why do I care? Um, well, I'm not going to make a very big promotional um, subsection of this talk, um, so I will do this very briefly. But Rust is a low-level language, fairly similar in that respect to C or C++. Um, but in contrast to these languages, uh, it is memory safe. So it does allow you to um, model memory at a very low level, but you cannot do it in such a way unless you use unsafe Rust um, um, that it um, gives you segmentation faults or, I mean, you cannot do things like use after freeze or um, dereference wild pointers and things like that. Um, it also has strong typing, so you have algebraic data types and all that. And uh, it focuses on zero cost attraction, so you do have things like in Python such as iterators, but they're usually completely compiled away because they're set up in such a way that they cost as little as possible. And um, this actually makes Rust really fit to write Python modules that need to go fast. So if you have some functionality that you implemented in Python, it's too slow, and you're thinking, well, maybe I should rewrite this in C, uh, I guess Rust is now another good option besides uh, C or C++. Okay, so I want to show briefly how Rust and Python uh, interoperate, um, and especially to show you how simple it is. Um, and in this, um, there are two parts. So one is PyO3, which is a Rust crate. So crate is a synonym in Rust for library. Uh, so it's a Rust library um, that bind, uh, uh, binds the Python interpreter. So you can use it either to expose Python functions, sorry, Rust functions and data structures to Python, but you can also use it to embed a Python interpreter in your Rust program. The other part is PyO3 pack, um, which can be used to compile Rust crates 
as Python wheels, and you can also upload them. So uh, using one command, you can rather than some Rust library produce a uh, Python wheel, and you can then easily upload it to PyPilot. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show a bit um, of the source code of uh, this actual module, just to show you um, how uh, it interoperates with Python. So sort of the central structure here is this struct um, py embeddings, and this actually maps to the embedding class that we saw in, in Python. And in this Rust, so I call it py embeddings because in Rust land, we also have an embeddings data structure and otherwise it would be unnice to have two data structures that are called embeddings. Um, and in that, um, we wrap the Rust land uh, embeddings. So there's this funny RC ref cell here. Um, in Rust, every um, piece of data has a single owner. Um, but here, um, since we're communicating with Python, we want to be able to share the embeddings between different classes. So this adds a reference counter. So you get the same kind of memory management as Python then, which also uses reference counting. So we now promote this whole thing to be a Python class by just saying, okay, this is a Python class using an attribute, and the name of this Python class is embeddings. So there's one more thing to do, so that makes it a Python class, uh, but we also have to register it in the module. So we define a module in uh, a function, which we mark with the PyModule attribute, and then um, in that um, function, we add to the Python module um, this new class, and then the class is known um, in Python land. Of course, this class by itself is not very useful yet because uh, it doesn't have any methods or properties. So um, the next thing that we do is then adding methods to this class, and this you do using a normal Rust impl block. So in Rust, methods on a data structure are implemented in an impl block, and um, again, we use an attribute to mark now that this is not a regular Rust impl block, but we promote it into a block of Python uh, methods. Um, so um, once we do that, everything that's in this block is going to be a Python method. So now we have this method similarity, uh, which was used to, to, to find similar words, and um, this whole method now becomes a, a Python method. So there are some funny things going on here. So first of all, this is a Rust thing, so um, it's a bit like um, self in Python, so that you can refer to the object itself. We also get as the argument the Python interpreter, so that we can communicate with Python if necessary. But these two are just Rust types. So here it says word is a string slice and limit is uh, an unsigned integer. And what PyO3 does for us automatically is um, convert this Rust data type into a Python string. So this Rust string reference into a Python string. And this uh, Rust, or actually goes the other direction. So it converts a Python string in a Rust string reference and the Python um, number or integer to a Rust unsigned uh, integer. So it does that automatically for us. And we can also use attributes to, for example, uh, give default values for mm -hmm. arguments. So here we say, well, the argument limit by default is 10, so if it's not specified, that's going to be the value uh, of that argument. So I will skip the next few things uh, due to time constraints. Um, um, well, very briefly, this one. So getters and setters, you define in a similar way, so you make um, methods for them in Rustland, and you just mark it with the getter attribute or the setter attribute, and that's it you have these now in Python land. Okay, so the final thing is then you have implemented your module, and this is where PyO3Pack comes into action. So you say to PyO3Pack, please build uh, a wheel for me. It figures out which Python interpreters are available. So here we have 2.7 and everything up to 3.7, and then it builds the wheels for you for all these versions. And you can also use PyO3Pack upload, and then it will upload the wheels to um, PyPy. Okay, so um, if you want to know more about Final Fusion, you can find it on this web page, and you will find the specification, all utilities, and libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. <laughs> Questions? Take, of course. <coughs> Uh, you were setting the embed. You had a terminal command, and you were setting the uh, depth of the embeddings or the length. And also, you said that you were. Um, yeah, I think you were going back. Yeah, Here. this one. Yeah. Uh, you were setting dimensions and also the min count. So that's that's a bit redundant, right? Uh, okay. So the dimensions here means the vectors that are produced, or the embeddings that are produced, have 300 dimensions. The min count here means 
if, say, the word Groningen occurs fewer than 10 times in the corpus, we're not going to create an embedding for it or consider it during training. So it will be excluded completely from, from training. Oh, yeah, now I get it. Yes, thanks. Yeah, so thank you. It was actually very interesting. Um, but I was uh, wondering, so did you actually uh, develop a new algorithm yourself or did you use some existing algorithms such as FastX, Glove or word uh, vec and make a new uh, implementation for this? Right, so um, the history here is, uh, so the answer is yes, we use existing algorithms and the uh, sort of backstory here is that I at some point used FastX and FastX has subword units, which is really nice because you can assign embeddings to unknown words. But then I also wanted two other models in FastX, which FastX didn't provide, uh, namely the, the, the structured skipgram model and the dependency embedding model, which Sebastian Fuchs implemented. So then we decided, well, we want to combine so many things that are not in uh, FastX, and of course, because it's just fun, that we made our own implementation. But in terms of algorithms, it's Nikolov's uh, skipgram algorithm, it's uh, Lingendahl's uh, structured skipgram, it's Goldberg and Levi's dependency embeddings, but we just combine a lot of different algorithms and uh, context types into one uh, program. So um, uh, we, well, we are working on some new stuff as well, but it now it's combining a lot of different existing algorithms. More questions? Okay, thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Okay.